Welcome back to Talor. Today, we'll be covering something a little different from our usual topics, culture and ecology. The people of the Tainori inhabit a stubby peninsula known as Tainor. The peninsula itself was mainly Mediterranean in climate, with golden to beige flora and vast tracts of narrowed, airy forests and heat-beaten countryside. Tainor was a staging ground for migrations from humans and animals alike. The east coast of, of Tainor has the oldest evidence of stone tools in Talor, likely being where humans first landed. Agriculture was also first practiced here, and most crops culti cultivated by humans or originates here. This is due to the local wheat and other cereals being annuals, meaning they produce seeds year-round and they are quite durable to drought and other tough c conditions. Four names for Tainor often feature that language's word for bread, as these widespread cereals are mainly used for bread and ale, hence for Tainor's nickname. During the time of the Great Kingdom of Iridea, Tainor was called Imbra Hills Garden, as it was the main producer, food producer sorry, of, of the nation. Tainori agriculture is also why the harvest season is in autumn. You see, when the first month of autumn, a Nordin, rolls around, Large storms from the tropical sea of silver are carried by wind and water up to Tainor. The torrential downpour during autumn waterlogs the usually dry climate, and so these crops of wheat and barley, which have adapted to these seasonal storms, produce many more seeds than usually than usual with the extra water. This cycle continues even outside of Tainor, where during an ordin, the wheat and barley fields suddenly overgrow with grain as farmers struggle to store it all and work it into ale or bread. This stormy season in Tainor is called the Munilior Al Anordin, which translates to the rains of Anor. In terms of Tainor's creatures, they are quite similar to our own. Due to Tainor acting as a bridge for newly transported animals to enter Talor, most Tainori fauna and flora is quite familiar to us. The life here has not had enough time to evolve and diverge from earth creatures, so the food web is taken up by familiar faces. At the top are lions. This particular species, called step stalkers by the locals, are also found in the prairie of the Irul Plain in western Taramir. These beasts thrive by hiding in the tall beige grasses, ambushing the other herbivores. Speaking of herbivores, creature, creatures such as mouflon, wild goats, and strange gazelle-looking creatures called urtan roam the country of Tainor. They are infamously aggressive and competitive beasts, not tolerating humans in the slightest. The reason for such skittishness is unknown, though naturalists assume that this is due to the constant fear of lion ambushes. These hooked grazers travel in groups of 40 to 80 to avoid predators and have strength in numbers. Some scavengers of Tainor include a subspecies of, hy of hyenas, which are smaller and more skittish than their earth counterparts in Earth's savanna of the Serengeti. These little omnivores will supplement their diet with fruits, and Tainori farmers are wary of any hyena packs in their local area, as they are known to break into the occasional pantry to steal what they can before running away with their tails between their legs. Other scavengers include pred predatorial vultures known as Urganac as well as a few species of rodents which live in complex burrowing co colonies. Tainor is not known for its large roam and herbivores, or any large animals at all for that matter. This lack of megafauna has made the inhabitancy of Finor much easier compared to say the borderlands or windswept Ashel. New towns and villages are relatively safe from the local environment, though lions are feared and reviled. Huge hunts of, of up to a hundred men are organized if one such lion has gone man-eater, and just to be safe, every lion in the vicinity is hunted and slain. This has only made lions more afraid and warier of humans, which means they're even less seen, and thus their mystery and fear around them only grows, and the cycle re repeats. The Fainori people themselves are the only culture in Taramir to not be directly descended from one of the Alowan cultures, a people group which comprises a decent portion of Talor and of which makes up Iridae's main traditions. They are actually descended from the Hishlanders of Haldramar, and thus share much of the Hish's cultural features, though it should be said that the Fainor's original Hishlander traditions are being weaned out over time, as the influence from Iridae puts them under the Alowan yoke.
Much like other Hishlander cultures, the Tainori have a matrilineal system of descent, meaning that they track descent through the female line. If a Tainori would want to pass on their possessions to a relative once they passed, they can only give it to people who are children of their daughter, or their daughters, aunts, or mothers themselves. Descendants of aunts and sisters would also be eligible according to Tainori law, plus said aunts and sisters, of course. A great deal of importance is placed on your mother in Tainori culture. She is supposed to do most of the parenting, although it's not always true, and some families are known to share parenting duties equally. While you go to your father for your advice on work, responsibilities, and blunt realism in terms of your issues, you would go to your mother for advice on relationships, personal life, and for comfort or reassurance. A Tainori will always find a home in the village of their mother, and all of their m mother's Relatives would happily take them in in times of need or if they're just vis visiting. Marriage in Tynor is handled differently depending on the region of Tynor and sometimes even the town. In some places, many the Lake County of Eanor and the river lands of Nymerisun, a public celebration is held in the town square where a makeshift open air pub has been set up, barrels of ale and all. In some areas, mostly Dor Kellos and Dor Barald, a more conservative celebration is held in the local temple where the festive where the festivities will often spill out into, into the house of the wed anyways what is constant is that after the after the festivities are had over the next week the families of the bride and groom will exchange gifts and goodwill payments basically paying each other to have the son or daughter of the other house the Finori are matrilocal, which is a fancy word meaning that when two Finori get married, the husband will move into the household of his wife, where they'll raise their own family, and their sons will move out into the house of their bride, while the daughters will stay and marry. Once those daughters marry, their husbands will move into their house and have their own children, so the cycle continues. Other than the importance placed upon the female relatives, the second main feature of the Tainori is their classes. The aristocracy of Tainor have a bit of an obsession with, se with separating themselves from the common folk called Merivin. The Merivin wear earthy, warm colours such as browns, reds, beiges, yellows and oranges. This is due to the local red and brown rock of Tynor being easily crushed, mixed with water and local beige grasses, and turned into dyes of these colours. This cheap clay dye is used to add a bit of artistic flair to the clothing, as the Tynori hold textiles and weaving in high regard, and more on that later. Meanwhile, since warm and earthy colours of clothing are associated with the common folk Merivan, the aristocracy will go out of their way to import dyes which are cooler in colour, such as blues and greys. They will then hire their best clothiers and weavers to make blue and grey garb for them, all just to appear distinct from the red and orange clothing of the common folk. These dyes can be quite expensive and hard to procure in the first place, as the only reliable source of them is in the jungle land of Odira, far to the south in the Sea of Silver. The differences don't end at dyes, however. The aristocracy are known for their flamboyant robes and draping cloth, jokingly called curtain robes by foreigners. These garments are impractical and blow away the first whiff of wind, and are not easily tied together with buttons or buckles to keep it from flying off the wearer. However, they look rich and gorgeous, so it doesn't really matter. Meanwhile, the Mervin don't have the time or funds to make elaborate clothing. Rather, they stick to practical vests, gambeson, and trousers. Besides the Fionor's obsession with clothing to separate the two main classes, more obvious differences can also be seen. Merivin live in wattle and daub and stone homes built around a central open-air kitchen and dining area, with other buildings branching off. A whole family of people will live in one house, from aunts to sisters, to children to husbands to grandparents and parents. The Merivin work their respective crafts on whatever schedule suits each individual, so no one really cares as long as they produce their weekly quota, which the tax collectors check to see is, is fulfilled when they go around for taxes. This quota can be goods produced, number of people served, and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, the aristocracy have large manors and properties of vast decorations and gardens, as well as doing mainly managing, economic, and scholarly work. 
The Mervin are the class which have the highest percentage of, of Tainora people, with about 35% of the Mervin being foreigners who have either been in Tainor for a very long time or are staying there for the time being. Meanwhile, over 70% of the aristocracy have foreign blood. This is due to the nobles of Tainor intermarrying with foreign lords to establish trade and positive diplomatic relations. This has led to a large portion of the aristocracy being only a quarter or an eight Tainori. How the Merovin view the, arist the aristocrats is complicated to say the least. Some despise them, some like them as they trade with them, some feel indifferent and think of them as just another part of their society. Aristocrats interact with the lower classes of the Merovin extremely frequently as they are the working force which produces their foods, silks and weapons. At the end of the day, they are both just different groups of people who do different things. The labourers of the Merovin are farming, crafting, smithing, cooking, physical labour, whilst the work of the aristocracy is business, trading, writing, scholarship and leadership. If the whole thing with the aristocracy trying to divide themselves from the common Merovin by wearing different coloured clothing wasn't enough to convince you that the Tainori are obsessed with textiles, I really don't know what will. They are known for their fine silks, clothing and other woven creations such as tapestries. Many Prafiner borderlander lords would pay a pretty penny for a Tainori tapestry or cloak, much more than their competitors. The Tainori are nicknamed the people of the cloth for a reason. However, the finest cloth of the Tainori can be seen in their specific embroidery known as Tele Akan. Tele Akan is a form of embroidery used by aristocrats and upper class Merovin. It is incredibly intricate and is made by weaving images, both abstract and literal, into one's clothing. These embroideries represent major life events of the wearer, achievements, triumphs, and for the rare aristocrats who have a modicum of humility, they may also include some failures as well into their garb via Tele Akan. These symbolic swirls, images and sigils can only be truly read by other Tainori, though foreigners can get a decent idea of the person's achievements through some of the more literal scenes within the embroidery. Tainori people themselves are short of stature compared to their towering counterparts in Praff and Durinia. They have tanned to light brown skin, black, brown or hazelnut eyes and pointed features, often being described as arrow-like by foreigners. The nobles and merchants of Tainor also tend to be quite skinny, and since those people are most foreigners' experience with, Tain with Tainor, they assume them to be, to be frail and short people. This stereotype is usually meant jokingly, and Tainori often get behind it and make a laugh of it by bringing to gatherings and taverns the tallest, most muscular, most muscular Tainori that they know, often taller than other foreigners. While the Fainori worship all Aloran gods, they place great significance on Anor, goddess of nature, autumn, hunting and love. This is due to autumn being the Tainori time of the harvest, Alongside spring, though to a lesser extent, her shrines are commonplace, and every homestead and vineyard is a small wooden structure dedicated to Anor. Another significant god to the Fainori is Urtarin. He who is shrouded in stars and mystery, he who guards through the gates of the next, lord of the dead and the night. Tainori poets and artists are in love with undeath and the underworld. Many of Tainor's great epics are about heroes bargaining with Urtarin to venture into the realm of the dead. The reasons for doing so range from saving a past loved one to finding magical artifacts within the next. However, if one were to slight or deny Urtarin's hospitality, all they could do to, all they could do to ease their end would be to pray to every god of every land for salvation. Urtarin would never let such a salvation happen, for once you enter Venex, there is no returning. <clears throat> On a cheerier note, the Tainori do not see death like we do. When we hear Lord of the Dead, images of Hellfire and Satanic Horns pop in, pops into mind. However, Orturin is much less viewed as a, de as a demonic evil god, but rather a, par a peaceful harbinger of the beyond. He is depicted as a calm, collected being, shrouded in a star-riddled cloak for a reason.
the actual afterlife itself has many names the next the after the overworld the beyond and so on and so forth what it actually is no one knows whether it is oblivion a reflection of life a haven of eternal happiness or a frozen over hellscape is unclear some even think that there are different levels of the next with the good peaceful levels reserved for virtuous people and the more hellish levels reserved for evil folks and wrongdoers the fine nori often think of the next as a pale reflection of life an eternal journey with all the joys and struggles which mortal life brings however everyone has a slightly different idea of what's on the other side and any broad cultural trends are covered here not the exceptions the tainori inhabit a prosperous maritime nation hence why some tainori think themselves superior to other peoples and more educated this is untrue however the sheer amount of wealth and trade flowing through the tainori economy cannot be overstated the high city of grey bay or sonorif is said to be the largest and greatest city in Talur, and it is right on top of the choke point between the sea of silver and the ralkar channel which leads to Amia to the north the vast majority of Taloran trade goes through the circuit and must go through grey bay this has made it fabulously fa fabulously wealthy with rumors saying the inner sanctum of the high cathedral in grey bay is made of silver and gold only priests of the high cathedral can actually enter the inner sanctum so whether this is true is unknown Tynor also has a complicated relationship with its neighbours in Dorinia and Praf. After Iridea's firm takeover of Taramir, the Prafans and Doridians practically worshipped the kingdom, even more so after it fell. Any older men in villages and towns would have had grandfathers which enjoyed the prosperity of Iridea before the father worms came down from the mountains and led it to ruin. This reverence of Iridea is contrasted by a good deal of Tainori people disdaining it, spitting to the west as a sign of rebellion, as Iridea came from the west to conquer Tainor. The Iridean takeover is seen as a choking out of Tainor's independence and traditions. The people of the county Dorbereld especially despise Iridea, and are known to start tavern fights in, in almost every land which revered the old kingdom. I will cover the politics of Talor, how it is ruled, and who rules it in another video. And that should do it for now. Um, yeah, all of the real life row photographs are by other people, and you could see those people in, in the credits right now. And all drones and maps are by me, yours truly. Um, thank you for so much support. It's actually insane to have 200 people being subscribed to the channel so now we can form our own official town with, with that many people um but anyways so that's insane and i know it's the stereotype for creators and influencers god i, I hate that name but anyways for them to be like oh i'm so grateful and and all this shite but then to have but you couldn't really understand that by having it happen to you and i really cannot thank all of you enough for that support it's it's been crazy um and i don't usually ask you but if you want to you can like and, su and subscribe to show said support and maybe even comment if you're feeling like it as these videos take a lot of time and effort you can tell because this one took about two months <laughs> um yeah i, I took a, a, a small hiatus with you know um real life and christmas and all this but now i'm back i'm back at it um i hope that you enjoyed it and i'll see you next time cheers